What's up, everybody? This is John Morgan. I'm the CEO and the founder of the media company Live Your Purpose, where we house a podcast, Live Your Purpose Podcast. And I am coming to talk to you about our first ever LYP R&B relationships and building. We have created a safe space for all entrepreneurs, all creatives, all influencers, any type of freelancer in this area. We want to see you out, man. We want to give you the opportunity to build amongst your greatest asset, which is not only yourself, but who you connected with, man. Who's your network? Who's your network connected to? We want to give you the opportunity to build with other like-minded people here in the area. And even if you're a person who doesn't qualify under those under those terms, we still want to see you out here. We're going to have prize giveaways, we're going to have food, refreshments, and lastly, we're going to be playing the greatest R&B songs that you ever heard. So please come out February 26, 12 to 3, it's on a Saturday, 380 South Main Street, Creative Art Gallery. Can't wait to see you out. LYP R&B, peace. Welcome everybody to another episode of the Leah Purpose Podcast. I'm your host, John Morgan Jr. Um, first and foremost, before we get into who our wonderful guest is for, the, for this evening, um, allow me to just say thank you, you know, to the community of LYP. Uh, you guys have been doing a tremendous job of giving us genuine and organic support and allow us to build this thing. We're steady building the community here at LYP, and I'm genuinely thankful for that. I never take that for granted, um, and I'm genuinely grateful to have you guys, man, anybody who whether that's supporting the merchandise, whether that's supporting the products, whether that's just telling a friend about what we're doing over here at LYP, whether that's coming out to the events that we're having in the community, man, I just want to say thank you. I genuinely appreciate that. So thank you to everybody who's constantly been supporting. Um, what we're doing, man, is we're really tr trying to be intentional here. You know, and, and our next guest that we have here on, on this episode, man, it's a, just an individual, man. And I'm, I'm really interested, you know, to, to really dive into this guy's story and to you know hear some of his backstory and we we have we have some very we have some conflicting ideas but i think that at the end of it i think we will have a, a healthy conversation to be able to um agree on some things and agree to disagree on some things this guy man he's a he's a star and i'm, I'm really interested to, to you know to, to hear hearing his story um i want you to help me out with your pronunciation of your name because i do not want to butcher it um, <laughs> but, it's, but it's daniel Man, is it Mangina? Is that the correct pronunciation? It's Mangena. It's Mangena. Mangena. But, Mangena. but you know what? I have to say, John, that I can't really get mad with anyone for mispronouncing it because <laughs> the E after the G makes you think it should be a soft G, but it's actually Come on just, now. it doesn't change. Come on now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A man, a man <laughs> who was understanding and objective. I, I, I appreciate that. Listen, man, I want to I wanna run down this, this intro um of you because i you i usually try not to even get caught up in so much in, in people's bios and the intros sometimes people can you know they, they can put sauce on it you know what i'm saying and put a, put a little <laughs> bit extra into it you know to make to make it sound good but yours is very captivating um and i, I just want to be able to just you know speak to who we have to, today you know for our audience um mm -hmm. and daniel man he is a successful entrepreneur a best-selling author a podcast host of Duel with Dan and Beyond Success, a life and business transformation coach, an international public speaker who is known for programs and content that take clients and students to next level living. He has helped thousands of people across the globe achieve wealth mastery and truly abundant lives. He was named in the Wall Street Journal as a master of success and listed as one of the 10 top life coaches to watch for in 2021. Um, Daniel also offers coaching and consultations in groups and one-on-one -on -one sessions. Each of these sessions honors his mission and helps his clients find abundance, meaning, and joy in their lives. That's a hell of an intro, man. That's a hell of a motto. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what? Um, it, it always helps to have a very good copywriter put it ah, together. <laughs> yeah, I, I like that, man. You're, you're Jamie's a awesome. guy, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Jamie's good. Jamie's good. Jamie's good. Well, shout, really good. Shout, out, shout out to Jamie. Yeah, mm -hmm. shout, shout out, shout out to Jamie. Well, listen, mm -hmm. man. I um, we're we're in a new year. Um, mm -hmm. and I I really want to try. I really like asking people genuinely, "How are you?" Not just like mm -hmm. a a traditional intro of just checking in. How are mm -hmm. you? How are you in this moment? How's your spirit? How's mm -hmm. your health? How's your wellness? How are you? How is Dan doing today? You know what? So I've got a one year old. 
<laughs> I'm laughing because I, I, my two, my one year old will be two at the end of February. So I, you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. And um, my wife and I had a disagreement on certain mm. protocols that I wanted to put in place in a, mm. like have him sleep in his own bed. No, I want him to sleep with me. Let's start weaning him. No, yeah. every little thing, breastfeed, every little thing, breastfeed. So she just went away for three days. Mm -hmm. We live down in Cabo. We live in Cabo, Mexico. We've got a full-time nanny. Okay. Our nanny has got, Isabel, she's got the secret sauce for Ethan. She can put him to sleep. <laughs> She can, like, without needing to breastfeed him, she can do everything. She fell mm. ill. Mm. So I've been dolo with the baby for three <laughs> days. And I haven't got breasts with milk in them. So yeah. I haven't really had much sleep because he's been up every hour looking for his mum, blah, 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 blah. Last night was a bit better. So I'm kind of I'm kind of tired right now. But I'll go back today. All is right with the world. I'm going to sleep tonight. So I'm very excited about that. Wow. Wow. Listen, man. Um, I completely under <laughs> understand, man. I mean, I, I mean that, I mean that genuinely for the depths of my soul. I, 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 I understand it. Listen, I know people have told you that wait until the terrible tools come. Mm -hmm. Wait until wait until they hit 18 months. I mean, it is a Listen, I was just telling my wife earlier this morning, I said, listen, and we have we have a um we have our second child um coming in, in, in April. So I told okay. I was telling my wife, I said, listen, I said, we have to continue to, you know, um to show a united front because he's they're gonna gang up on us. <laughs> he's he's trying to get us. I mean, he's a brilliant <laughs> little guy. I mean, he he goes in between the both of us. I said, we have yeah. to continue to form a united front because this little guy is good, man. <laughs> I mean, he, he's he's good, man. So I'm I'm, I'm yeah. glad to hear that you are, you know, getting back into your, you know, your regular uh, scheduled program of things. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and congratulations to you, man. Fatherhood is a beautiful thing. Hundred percent. Likewise, congratulations listen, to anyone. Listen, speaking, speaking, speaking to that. Thank you, by the way. Speak, speak, speaking of that, man. Talk to me a little bit about maybe some of the um unsuspected pressures that you that you felt with you know being a father and being a business owner, um, mm -hmm. being a husband. You know, some, mm -hmm. some some of those things that you may have experienced that you didn't know was was on the on the build of, of fatherhood and being being mm -hmm. a husband. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? So the funny thing is that so I've got a stepdaughter who's six. So okay. I've been around her since she was two. Mm -hmm. um, I've got a lot of nephews and nieces, about a dozen of them. A couple of mm -hmm. my nephews and nieces are having kids, too. So I'm from a very big family. There's always been kids around. So the practical side, the changing of the diapers, the burping, feeding, the, I had that locked coming into being a dad, right? But what they don't tell you about <laughs> is for me, there's been this whole thing like, I'm responsible for what this human's gonna turn out to be because this human is learning quick example, and you've probably seen this too. So my wife's Russian, so she speaks to him in Russian. The nanny speaks to him in Spanish. We live down in Mexico where he was born. I speak to him in English. He's got three languages. Certain words, he's starting to say those words. Now, certain words he says in Russian, certain words he says in English, certain words he says in Spanish. There's that. Like, which one is he picking? Who knows which one mm -hmm. he's picking? Then mm -hmm. there's a little mm -hmm. thing like, when he wants to go outside, he'll go and pick up some shoes and come and bring shoes because he wants to go outside. Like when you, when I come home, he comes and he waves, hey, when you're going, bye. Like we didn't sit here and instruct him. Okay, when someone's mm -hmm. going out, when someone's coming in, when you want to go outside, they just learn this by observing the right. patterns. If you switch off and start behaving lackluster and douchey, the child doesn't even know that they're taking on lackluster and douchey behavior. They're just taking it on. So there's a yes. standard. There's a standard that we have to hold ourselves to as parents, because not mm -hmm. what we say, not what we instruct, not what we punish for, but how we're showing up every day is literally instructing. That one has been, it hit me viscerally when I started to see him waving and, and doing stuff like that. Where, where did he learn to do that? He learned just by witnessing and repeating. That's gonna happen with every, how they behave with money. 
how he's going to treat the women in his life, how he's going to allow people to treat him, right? How he's going to show up in society, the level of, 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 of determination and, and tenacity that he shows up with. It's not going to be from what we say. It's going to be from what he picks up from us as parents. That one, I would say, has been the biggest one for me in terms of fatherhood. Yeah, man, that's, that's huge. I mean, you know, coming up, man, my, my uncle always said, it's never about what you say. It's about what they see you do. And mm -hmm. I, never, I never truly understood that until I had children of my own. Because mm -hmm. like you said, man, it's the small gestures that we see them pick up on. And it's like, where in the hell did you learn that? I, I, we, we didn't have any sit down one on one. <laughs> I instructed you on, on how to say hello and things like that's not how it happened. Um, mm -hmm. But those are the instances where that, you know, we literally are able to see the, yeah, man, just how seriousness and the severity of what parenthood is really all about. So that's, that, that's very powerful. Listen, man, tell me, tell me a little bit about your, your origin, man. Who, who, mm -hmm. who is Daniel? You know, talk to me about the beginning, man, your, your childhood, your family dynamics, you know, when you mm -hmm. initially came up. Tell, talk to me about the, the beginning stages for, for Daniel. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So some people will tell from my accent, um, I'm actually from the UK. I was born and mm -hmm. raised in East London in the UK. My parents emigrated to the UK from Zimbabwe in the late 70s. They were education migrants. They weren't economic migrants. Uh, my dad wanted to go and do, pursue his master's at a university here. Um, I was a, a happy accident. I have two older siblings between my mum and dad. My dad's got kids from outside the marriage as well. But in terms of my mum's kids, I'm, I, I was a, an eight year difference after mm. my dad went away for a trip, nine years okay. later, I came back. So I was the welcome home present. Yeah. Right, and, then, and then there were a couple of balancing out siblings after me. Um, but yeah, education was a big part. Um, quite a conservative Christian household. Quite a very conservative Christian household I was brought up in. Um, education, be a good human, speak Queen's English. Those are big things for me growing up. Um, I was... Uh, I was caught up in something called the grade scandal in the UK in 2000 and 2002, I believe it was. Um, they changed the way that they did the examinations and they deliberately downgraded everyone. So I'd actually gotten to Keeble College, Oxford University to study. I ended up losing that place and going to a different university. I only did a year of that and decided to go off and be an entrepreneur instead. And that's kind of what I've been doing ever since then. I've had some wins. I've taken some L's. I've lost a couple of fortunes here and there. But this past, specifically, I would say this past tw 20 years has really been diving into learning about myself and how that loops in with entrepreneurship. I actually started on personal development early in that. I was reading Think and Grow Rich when I was a teenager. I read Psycho-Cybernetics when I was eight, 18 years old. Um, the Science of Getting Rich when I was 19, I was reading, you know, big books I was reading at a young age. Um, and so what I found that this journey over the last 20 years has been realizing that reading from a book isn't where it's at. It has to be applied. You have to have that life experience. You still require the wisdom of elders and people who have walked the path before you. Um, the importance of personal development, the importance of, of seeking counsel, the importance of, of recognizing that as humans, we rarely know everything, if anything at all. And right. that wisdom comes from recognizing how little we know and how much we don't know. Um, and that's how I've got to be the person I am today. Beautiful, man. Just, just recently, it seems like we've been hearing, um, when I say we, I'm, I'm talking about myself um, being African-Americans you know, um, in, in, the, in the States. I've been mm -hmm. recently hearing more people speak on their experience of being children of African immigrants in, in different areas and things like that, and the pressures that, that have come with that. And like you said, you know, being um, the, the pressures of, of, of education, you know, not mm -hmm. necessarily economics based, but the, the pressure of being children of African immigrants as it relates to education. Mm -hmm. And I, that's a fascinating experience to me because you, you rarely hear that. Um, mm -hmm. Could you speak to that experience and just what that was like being a child? Um, mm -hmm. of African immigrants and just like the pressure of, of education because us as Af well, myself as an African American, ha I've had my own pressure of what it's like to, you know, have that educational, you know, mm -hmm. just overbearing, you know, field, force field over, over me. So could you just speak to your, that experience a little bit? Yeah, sure. I mean, when we look at what society says, society's got this story about education 
being power when really education is about indoctrination right right it's about indoctrination into the way the system works and to fitting into the system effectively that's what it does education primes you to go out into the workforce and to be a good worker be to go and be a good citizen it doesn't really inspire you to be a maverick but as a society, we're, we're given this remit, you know, you, you finish your high school, you go off and you go and get your degree, you go off and get your postgrad if you want to take it a bit further, you go and get your career, maybe you do the postgrad later, you get married, you have a couple of kids, you pay your taxes, you work until you flat out, and then you finally get to live when you've retired. And so this narrative has been pushed and pushed and pushed and recycled. And when you've got people that have come from more disadvantaged backgrounds, for example, taking the immigrant stance and you get this narrative that's being spun out and regurgitated oh this is the way that you're going to find success in this new society mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then i think much like we as parents ourselves want the best for our kids we want to ensure i mean i'm now not so obsessed with my kids having education formal education i'm more obsessed with them critical thinking independent thought understanding how money works emotional intelligence yes. and the ability to, to have relationships. These for me are more what I'm going to be encouraging and supporting them doing. Having a variety of hobbies and, and, and activities that they engage in so they're a, a well-rounded human versus the narrow, just get education, it's going to fix everything. That may have worked at a certain point, but it's not the way the world's working now. The ability mm -hmm. to access and uh, work with information, the ability to relate to people, that's where true power is. And that's what I think um, some of our parents have lost sight of, that the old ways aren't necessarily going to work today. But I think with my parents, that they just wanted the best for me. And, and so this system works, do it, was their way of, of ensuring that the best was mine. So did you, did, you, did you struggle with your own pressure of trying to follow what your parents wanted, wanted you to do? Or because you said, man, you were reading some, you know, some powerful stuff early on, or were mm -hmm. you... Did you did you kind of get it per se early on and just kind of start doing your own work outside of what your parents, you know, were instructed to do? How did, how, did, how, did, how, did, how did that happen? So when I lost my place at Oxford, my immediate thing was, hang on a minute, I want to retake my exams and apply again to Oxford next year. Mum and dad said, no, you're going to university, just find a red brick uni. And so I went off and found the university, hated it, was still bitter and resentful about losing my place. Found out later it was a whole scandal, got really mad with it, um, and actually didn't speak to my dad for about a year and a half after that. Wow. Um, but I did end up just saying, look, mum, dad, I'm taking a gap year. I've been on that gap year for a couple of decades now. <laughs> so, you know, right. I'm, I'm, I'm taking the gap year. Um, and I just went off and, you know, went off and went into business. Um, I didn't have the wisdom and experience to be in business at that age, especially at the level that I was. But lessons came from that that support me to today in order to have sustained, you know, uh, financial success. But I would say, yes, there was some independence. But yes, there was also some butting of heads. And there were times when I said, yeah, OK, that's, you know, I'll do it, which is, you know, going off to Hull when I had the opportunity to, to retake my exams and, and go again for Keeble. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that, that's usually how it works, right? I mean, we have... It, it's, it's usually these these big events that take place in our lives that that usually cause us to do something completely different, you know, to get a completely different result. Um, mm -hmm. Right. I mean, even, even myself, you know, I, I really it took the pandemic, you know, for, for, for me and the transition of my mother um, in, in 2020 for me to kind of really dive deep into my entrepreneurship endeavors, you know, and really mm -hmm. chasing my dreams, so, so to speak. You know, there were these these massive historical um, monumental experiences that, you know, that I was um, going through that really say, you know, really made me really sit down and reevaluate what really, um, some things that I really wanted to do, some, something that I really wanted to leave my mark on, you know, and really wanted to um, really have a legacy, you know, behind what I was doing. Um, and mm -hmm. it sounds like, you know, your, your experience is very much in the same, but it was just happened a little bit earlier um, mm -hmm. for you. Um, speak, speaking of that pandemic, man, what have, what have you learned about yourself over the over these last two years? I mean, this is we're, we're still in the middle middle of it, mm -hmm. <laughs> but when you reflect back on 2020, you know mm -hmm. 2021, what have you learned about Dan? 
you know the funny thing being here in Cabo we had a six-week lockdown at the very beginning and other than that it's been pretty much life as normal wow so I haven't I haven't really had the same lockdown stresses that people have experienced um even when we were locked down for the six weeks, it, it was more my, my wife <laughs> losing her yeah. rag from being locked up in the house um, with my stepdaughter be, be, because Ethan actually was conceived at the beginning of <laughs> lockdown. He's a COVID baby. As ah, many, pandemic many, baby. Yeah. Pandemic baby. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like we had, you know, a very big place. Uh, we were allowed to move around in our development. So she could still use the playground. We had, we got our swimming pool. The gym was shut. So I had to just do like my workouts on the rooftop, but I got some equipment from my friend who's got a gym and I, I did that upstairs. Um, two of our neighbors, there are a couple, they're fitness trainers. So I didn't really have much issues with that. So what I've really learned is I would say how to deal with people who have varying opinions about stuff mm. and how about to it? allow <laughs> people to have their thing yeah and to respect and to learn how to deal with irrational fear mm -hmm. not other people's my own mm. right um because there's been some frustrating things you know luckily i already had quite a solid virtual platform but you know i was traveling a lot doing workshops and retreats in different parts of the world i like to go to italy a couple times a year i wasn't able to do that um so that was quite interesting to deal with. But for the most part, it's been my own irrational fears, um, dealing with people with varying opinions, constructive ways to shut off noise because there's been a lot of noise, right? Um, and how to not get in the middle of people's stuff. You know, this friend's arguing with that friend about that. My family's down the middle of vaxxers and anti-vaxxers, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. So yeah, that, I would say that's, you know, some of the lessons that I've been learning over this time. How, how, how have you dealt with that, man? How have you dealt with some of those irrational fears that you experienced? So it's really interesting. I was just interviewed just this morning for Oprah Daily, Oprah's magazine. Um, I'm going to be quoted, I think, Thursday of this week. I'm going to be coming out. Okay. We're talking about the fear of doing new things. And um, fun fact, I'm not sure if you know this or your listeners know it. We're actually only born with two fears, falling in loud noises. Everything else is learned behavior. You know I, I, I heard that. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we don't have any other fears that we're born with. Nothing else is naturally ours. Everything else is learned behavior. Mm. So when there is a fear that comes up and me, I define an irrational fear as a fear that doesn't have a conscious relationship to my actual experience. Right. Mm. So if it doesn't have a relationship to my conscious experience, that means a pattern has created a pattern that's created a pattern that's created a pattern that results in fear. Mm. And so the way that I get to the root of that is by naming it, bringing it out into the open. Okay, how do I feel in my body about this? I feel fearful. Okay, where's the fear sit? In my chest. Okay, what am I scared will happen? This will happen. Is that true? Can I be certain that that is true? Okay, and if that happens, what's the worst that happens? This. Can you be certain that's true? Can you be certain that's going to happen? What's the worst that does happen if that does happen? This happens. And follow that all to the end. And you're going to find that there's hardly ever anything as big and scary sitting on the other side of this as we're holding a narrative for. There's hardly ever something so dastardly and dangerous that we're holding a story for. And when we follow that, then we can actually ask, hang on a minute, am I even, can I resource myself to deal with this? There's a, a saying that I got from one of my mentors once, what's the worst that can happen? What's the best that can happen? And what's the most likely to happen? Look at the best that can happen. Are you resourced to deal with that? Because we need to be resourced to deal with the best. You got a windfall coming? Have you got a bank and a bank manager and a wealth manager and a lawyer and a team to support you to make the most of it, right? So even for good things, we need to be prepared. What's the worst that can happen? The worst that can happen is I lose, you lose your company. This, okay, can you resource yourself to deal with that? Can you prepare for that worst case scenario? What's the most likely to happen? Somewhere between this and this. Can you get the right team, the right support network, the right resources, the right mentorship, the right coaching to deal with that? And if you cover those bases, having brought it to light, interrogating it, and you can use a journal, you can partner up with someone and do like a voiced out practice, you'll find that it's rarely as scary as it looks, and you're actually probably more supportive than you even thought you were. Yeah, yeah, so you, 
it, by, by naming the fear, it, it gives you it, the power and the control stays within, you know, what you're able to control and what you're able to, you know, work through and what, what, what actions you're able to work through, which exactly. ultimately keeps the, the fear from manifesting into this snowball effect that's going to show itself Exactly. How, how you know however down the line yeah that's that is that is that is very powerful man i know i know for myself man when i when i reflected back over the years and just how much and, and i and i really understood it you know after having conversations with my parents and my elders you know when you know when i talk about experiences and things like that coming up and i was able to really pinpoint a lot of different ways and some of those ways which i wasn't really able to um at, at the time i i was embarrassed of admitting the impact that fear had really took a place hold on the decisions that I had made. And mm -hmm. through just being brutally honest with myself, I was able to just admit the fact that you no know, fear has got in the way of these things. But now when fear arises, I'm able to take a moment, take a moment, connect to my breath, call out the fear and what it is, allow mm -hmm. myself to have the moment mm -hmm. and I'm able to, and I'm able to work through it. But those are the, those are the things in which you refer to. I, if I, I, I hear think you correctly. You've really, you really hit it there on the head because I think, one of the, the most important things, and this is something that I, I said when I was being interviewed today, fear is a natural human emotion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And its role is just to keep you safe. It's the mind's way of trying to keep you safe. Trying right. to avoid it is nonsensical because it's energy is neither created nor destroyed. It needs to be transmuted. But we can't transmute an emotion that we haven't fully embodied. Bingo. To feel it. Okay, this is what I'm feeling. Okay, can I face this? What's the worst that can happen? What's the worst that can happen? What's the worst that can happen? And just feel it dissipating in your body. But you do have to feel it to move through it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that, that, that's very powerful, man. When I was when I was doing my research on, on you, um, one of the things that came up um, when I was, you know, just looking into some of your story, it says that you were diagnosed with Asperger's at the age of twenty. Um, twenty-seven. Twenty-seven. Mm -hmm. And talk talk to me about that experience and you know just just take me through a little bit about like what that was like being diagnosed that at at, at at a young age but also you know um early adult ages like just talk to me a little bit about that experience and like how that ultimately impacted you you know in those recent years coming after so that was a blessing that diagnosis because mm -hmm. i was suffering from crippling anxiety crippling social anxiety uh, crippling general anxiety crippling insomnia um because i i was forcing myself to operate in a mainstream world when I don't have the natural wiring for it and without having the systems in order to deal with that, right? Mm -hmm. So to put this into context, going to a supermarket for me can result in panic attacks, mm. right? Ask me to go and solve the debt crisis in a country and I'm going to be fine because I, I know how that works. I understand the economics. I can, but if you change at the last minute, something, and don't tell me that you've changed at the last minute, something as simple as, like, my wife will say, oh, can you go and do this? Oh, I've already mapped out my day. Like, that heart palpitations, blah, 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 panic attack, just, like, changing the script on me. Um, but I didn't know that that's what was going on. So I was just having all of these responses in my body, right, having you know, stomach issues from the stress. And it's all because I didn't know that I just needed the this, this structures in place to, to, to address it. So when I then knew, oh, hang on a minute. Oh, I'm just on the autistic spectrum. So this, 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 and this. So I just need this, this, and this. So now I can voice my needs like, hey, like I need some patience with that. Or hey, like I get overwhelmed from that. Or hey, like I need some help with that. Getting the team to support me. So for example, little things like arranging this podcast it wasn't me that did it. Amy took care of everything because I, that's no good for me. I'm, I can get into overwhelm. Sometimes I can handle it, but having the system in place of having my assistant make sure that gets taken care of so I can just show up and do my thing cuts this whole box of stress out. But I had to know about my diagnosis in order to understand, okay, I've got these superpowers. I've got that superpower. I've got that superpower, but I've got these areas where I need to be supported and then calling in that support to get everything done. Mm. Mm. So was it was it prior to finding out your diagnosis or was it post finding out your diagnosis is when you were struggling, you know, with the suicidal thoughts and, and that things of that before. nature? That, that was, was prior. Yeah. That was prior. So how did you I mean, what was 
was it simple things like, you know what, I need some help with what's going on. Let me go see what's going on. Did somebody suggest something to you? What was what was your process? So what happened is, um, I think it was like, yeah, I was 27 and I had a really bad spout of insomnia. And I've been get I've been getting insomnia for years, you know, as far back as one time that I can remember that I noted, oh, hang on a minute, this is insomnia. I think it was about 13 or 14 when I, mm. I, I remember that I'd had it. But this was a particularly bad spate. It had been about a week or two, and I just I just hadn't had a full night's sleep. It may be semi eyes closed, sort of resting, but no full REM sleep at all for a week or two. So I went to the doctors and asked for some sleeping tablets because I tried everything over the counter and it, it wasn't working. My normal coping mechanisms just weren't working. Um, so I went to the doctor. He gave me a, a sleeping medication called Zopiclone, gave me three tablets. He said, uh, I can't prescribe you any more than this because they're highly addictive. Don't take any more than two, but one will knock you out. I took one, John. Wide awake, I took another half. Wide awake, I took another half. Wide awake. Mm. So I go back to the doctor. I said, dude, you've got to have something stronger than this. Like, <laughs> I said, no, this is, this is the good stuff. I explained to him what happened. He said, well, then it's something going on. You need to talk to someone. And he referred me to a, a therapist. The therapist he referred me to, thank God, just happened to be a, a doctor that specialized in adults on the autistic spectrum. Mm. That's not what I got referred to her for, but that was her specialist area, CBT for mm -hmm. people on the autistic spectrum. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we started having some sessions and she identified that, you know, that was a high probability. And then we went ahead and did a, um, an, a, a test to check. And yeah, I came up very, very high functioning as in, Oh, on a scale of one to 54, 54 is the top of the scale. 16 is the top end for mainstream, like neurotypical. Uh, 32 is the score where they assign you to a special school. And my score is 27. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah, yeah. Man, so one, one of the things that I really like to do here, you know, when I have these conversations is in speaking, creative, speaking with creators and entrepreneurs is to really, you know, speak to them about their, their healing journeys um, mm -hmm. and, you know, really speak to them about them being intentional about their, their mental wellness. Um, mm -hmm. And we're able to really get to the root of tracing it back to some form of like childhood trauma in some capacity. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in doing your work, were you able to pinpoint the root of where your insomnia and, you know, where this anxiety, where you were really struggling, were you able to pinpoint maybe some of the childhood trauma that you experienced, where it was coming from, where it was stemming from? It was actually stemming from the fact that my nervous system was on fire because I was in a mainstream world without a plug-in for my needs, right? So you've got all of these inputs that my system wasn't able to deal with. So that heightened nervous system wasn't able to rest and sleep. That was what was really going on. It was, it was ongoing attack on the nervous system without the peace and quiet that it needed to be rested and relaxed. So after the diagnosis, when I was able to switch up how my environment was set up, to switch up um, you know, the support I was getting, my nervous system no longer had that level of distress. And so I very rarely, if at all, get insomnia anymore because I keep my nervous system well taken care of through breath work, through meditation, but also through my environment, the people, places, and things I keep myself around and that I keep around myself yeah. and being supportive of my needs. Man, prior, prior to being an entrepreneur, um, mm -hmm. I worked at a community mental health organization here in, in my city of Akron, Ohio, being a social worker where I worked primarily in elementary schools, junior high schools, and in high schools. Um, and a lot of work that what, what you're doing, a, a, lot of, um, a lot of the messaging and what I heard was the, the, the power of choice. But mm -hmm. the one thing that you always speak to and what you have just now spoken to is the importance of you know, environment. And mm -hmm. when I just heard you kind of just break down your experiences, I initially just thought about, you know, you talk about removing yourself from these environments. When I was working in these communities, man, working, you know, in, in the inner cities, working in the neighborhoods, you know, work, working with black and brown people who do not have the access to, to these resources that allow them to, you know, um, be able to really remove themselves from their, their environment. I just now, well, I, I shouldn't say that, but right now, um, I really thought about how many of, of our kids and how many of their parents and family members are, are probably on this, this scale of um, the, the autism scale and they're being misdiagnosed and mistreated because of it. Mm -hmm. And it's 
a lot of it is most likely simply due to them having some special needs and being connected to this world where it doesn't match up to what they're, you know, they who they to. are when what they need. Mm-hmm. And that and that, and that that is so that is so powerful. Mm-hmm. My, my, te- my, my TEDx is called um, What Suicide Taught Me About Life, and it speaks about my suicide journey and, and also how I accidentally overanalyze myself out of suicide and how in trying to commit suicide, the environment that I set up for myself to meet that goal actually became what saved me. Yeah, because you said you didn't want to fail at something again, right? Yeah, 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 exactly. So, yeah, so you, you know the line. It's like, I didn't want to fail at something. That's the only reason why I didn't try. And going off to try and work out how to not be a loser and reading and studying and trying to get my head right to do that, ended up rewiring myself so that I could go and make those other choices. To The point I'm making is the environment will have an impact on us whether we want to or not. No matter, no, what, right. no matter what we say we're going after, if the environment isn't supportive of you, if the environment isn't conducive to your growth, it's going to be very physically difficult for you to be in an enhanced experience in your life. So we do need to, and I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth, right? I think we see in the world today this very interesting juxtaposition of people that say, woe is me, this is my environment, nothing's going to change, or woe is you, this is your environment, nothing's going to change, to the, doesn't matter what your environment is, you can change, when really it's somewhere in the middle. It's the gray, correct. It's a gray area. Someone Mm -hmm. who's, you know, born to alcoholic parents or drug addicted parents in a drug riddled environment, the likelihood that their environment is going to be supportive to them being a healthy adult is, is very low. The likelihood that they're going to have sufficient agency to make the choices to do something about that is very low. And for me, that's part and parcel of what the mission is for people like yourself, people like myself, to be out there as a light to those people that don't know that they have another choice so that they can start to do the work of uplifting themselves because nobody can mm-hmm. save you. We have to save ourselves to go and make the difference. And it may not be that we get all the way to the goal that we'd intended. We may may not completely heal, quote unquote. We may Mm -hmm. not completely overcome the the trauma. We may not completely overcome the circumstances, but at least we can start chipping away at it and be in a positive momentum so that we're not stagnant beings, we're growing beings, even if we don't grow exactly into what we decided that we want to grow. What's up everybody, it's John Morgan. Listen, I want to come to y'all and tell y'all right now where you can go and get your LYP merch, www.lypp.org. That's where you can get all the fly crew necks like the one I got on right now. You can get your hoodies, your hats, any type of product that we sell in that LYP. You have to go to the website to get it. You can't go to Amazon or no, no third party company to get our products. You gotta go to www.lypp.org. Right now, you get all of this latest stuff, LYP. You can also get information on the pod, new information on the episodes that we got dropping, anything LYP related. Go to that website right now, lypp.org. Peace. Correct, correct. And we're, and we're not going to be able to save everybody, right? <laughs> you know, I, I remember, when again, when I was doing this work, when I would sit down and have these conversations with my therapist about how much I was stressed about the, the important and impactful work that I was really doing within these schools. And it's like, listen, I'm doing all of this stuff. You know, the child is still struggling. The school mm-hmm. is doing X, Y, and Z. You know, they're not really setting up the, the proper protocols to be able to help the child and the family as much as possible. And mm-hmm. I, remember she, I remember her telling me just straight up, John, you're doing the best you can and mm-hmm. you can't really control too much and you can't, and you can't save everybody. You know, mm-hmm. life is going to happen, you know, whether I do something or not Mm -hmm. um and that was one of the revelations that uh, that freed me in that moment because it let me know that like you know what I don't need to control every outcome you know that that Mm -hmm. comes that comes in front of me you know that was that that was the fear you know Mm -hmm. going going back to what we were talking a little about earlier um that was the fear that I was struggling with trying to bend the universe and bend people's needs and wants and be as genuine as I could to let them know like hey I'm telling you this truth. I need you to listen to me. Mm-hmm. If you do this, you follow my role, you'll be just fine. But the reality is people are going to do what they need to do. Everyone's and people are going to have journey. their own experiences. Yep. Everyone's on their own journey. And 
so I've got, an, I think we've got an article about it. I can't remember. Um, but I once did a series of videos on what I learned failing to make people millionaires. So I focus a lot <laughs> on teaching people to be financially independent and to create wealth. That's what we do. Not just the strict strategy, but the emotional resilience that's required at each level of wealth, the mindset that's required. Uh, and we teach people money and DNA, so on and so forth. And our signature program takes people from zero to 1.6 million. And we've got people that have gone up to the million and beyond. We've got people that got to six figures and got financial freedom. We've got people that paid us a lot of money and didn't even open up the program, right? And I used to get really frustrated and I was trying to drag everyone along. Come on, you've paid me money. I want to, I want to, if you just do this, but they paid money and they're still not following through. And you know, one of those three lessons, one of those three things that I learned was I've got to show up and be in integrity in terms of me serving them to the best of my ability. Yeah. And that's it. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, elaborate, man, on your, on your thought process on the, everybody has a choice because mm -hmm. after, after listening to what we're saying, I think, I think we do agree on, on a lot of things um, mm -hmm. where number, number one, um, your environment is a big part of it. And mm -hmm. There are some other steps that are going along with it, but just elaborate on your mindset and how you see things as far as everybody has a choice. Well, first and foremost, we need to remember that most choices are actually happening at the unconscious level, mm. right? As much as 97% of what we're illustrating to be a conscious choice is actually an unconscious program playing out as us speaking a conscious choice. Right. But the unconscious, we, none of us woke up this morning with our unconscious programming. It was built over time. Right. So even the little bit of time that we're consciously aware, we have the opportunity to, uh, you know, to deploy some agency in terms of what's in the environment that's going to lead to the unconscious programming, that's going to lead to the choices consciously and unconsciously. So uh, are you familiar with the concept of circles of influence? I'm not. So it's, um, you've got a big circle and you've got a little circle. And mm -hmm. we've only got influence over the little circle. And the more time that we spend trying to control the outer circle, the less control that we actually have instead of being intentional with that circle of influence that we do have. And then that allows us by default to spill over and have that influence on the rest of it. Right. The unconscious right. moves at 10,000 to 10 million times the speed of the conscious mind. If I'm trying to change myself, by the time I've had one choice, one thought, sorry, one conscious thought, I'm going to change this behavioral pattern. Your unconscious already had 10,000 to 10 million <laughs> thoughts playing out the same old pattern. It's too fast. And that's why it's important for us to have an environment that supports that change. For us to understand simple things like we use love languages a lot in our work. No. Not, not because love languages says... Um, not because of the, the thing about relationships, romantic relationships, anything like that. But if you think about this, I don't know if you're familiar with what your love languages are, but my one is act of service, right? I'm a words of affirmation man words to the affirmation. core. Yes. Words of affirmation. Okay. <laughs> yes. So when you affirm you're beloved, me, please. Affirm <laughs> me. <laughs> so when, when your beloved then comes mm -hmm. in and she comes home and she brings you a gift, mm -hmm. and you you don't really feel the love, mm -hmm. right? Or she's trying to hug you and kiss on you, and it's like, but you know, I need to, I need to have those, those. Physical, physical touch is number two. Physical touch okay. is number two. Okay, we'll, we'll give you that. We'll give you that one. But it's not a conscious thought that you don't feel. The right, most. right. It's unconscious. So our love language is the language that our unconscious can understand. It's a way of getting mm -hmm. a message in through the unconscious. Mm -hmm. So when you even understand that, you can set up your environment. So that you're getting the messages of what you want to change in yourself in the language that your unconscious understands so that it can take that new program and build it up over time. Yeah. But there are people who are word of affirmation and they're not honoring that. There are people who are acts <laughs> of service. They're not honoring that. And they're wondering why their unconscious isn't changing to the new program and allowing them to make the new choices that are going to give them a new life. Yeah. Mm. See, see, I, I, I agree with that, man. Um, the way that I like to, you know, um, impose, impose my thoughts in the conversation is I'm a big believer in, in empathy. Empathy mm -hmm. is like one of the strongest emotions that I feel, you know, can carry us so, and so, and so far. And mm -hmm. I believe that empathy allows us to release that control, right? Mm -hmm. you, know, you, know, you know, it, it, it allows us to um, allow people to be themselves, to, to, to have their own story, have, take their own time, and still loving them from a distance. 
Mm-hmm. And practicing empathy for me makes it okay for people to have choices. The, the, the hard time, the thing that I have sometimes with messaging, I guess, when it goes to like, everybody has a choice, sometimes it can kind of come off as being unempathetic um, to people's you experience, you, you, know mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? So that's, yeah. the, that's the biggest thing for me is like, yeah, we have choices, but we got to be empathetic to people's experiences um, yeah. because- so, so my, my thing is this, John, not to cut you, but my thing is this. No, you go, go ahead. I don't have the right to impose my story on someone else. Yeah. So I don't run around saying everyone has a choice, quit being a little punk and get on with it. That's right. I'm more, everyone has a choice. That choice is happening consciously or unconsciously, whether you like it or not. If you desire to be in a situation where you can exercise more agency in the choices that you're making, let's sit down and put in some work. Mm-hmm. I'm all about honoring where you're at. I'm a firm believer in the power of the human experience. I'm a firm believer in, um, in honoring the, the contrast that is a part of the human experience. But even in the face of that, whether we like it or not, choices are being made consciously and unconsciously. And the more time that we spend in our conscious time, having a de- deliberate, deliberate and conscious relationship to what's going on with our programs and how we're supporting what we want to be happening there, the more likely we are to get to where we want to get to at the end of the day. Yeah, I, I completely I completely agree with that. Listen, yeah. man, I want to talk a little bit about how I even came to find out who you were. Um, <laughs> uh, this is this is a this is a funny ass story, man. So yeah. a good a, a good friend of mine is a a business and life coach, mm-hmm. right? And I had um I had participated in a virtual workshop that he had, and mm-hmm. I was just talking to him about some of the aspirations and things that I wanted to do. And basically what he told me in a nutshell, he was like, John, I think you can, you know, you could really be a successful life coach. You could, I could see coaching in your, in your future. And I'm like, ah, I don't know, man. You know, just don't, <laughs> when, I, when I hear the phrase life coach, I think about Will Smith and Hitch and like, you know, a, a corny dude just telling some, some foo-foo shit. And it's like, ah, that, 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 that don't read for me, right? So, but, but, when he, but when he said it, and this is, this is a guy that I, I, I trust his, um, I, I trust his word, you know, he's, he's mm. a genuine guy. So mm. what he said to me stuck with me. So I said, you know what, I'm going to do some research, um, just kind of look into it a little bit. Um, and I said, the first thing I'm going to do is, all right, I got to see myself in this field, you know. Where are the black life coaches at? I don't know no black life coaches ever. So I'm like, Google, top black coaches in the world. It was maybe a few. And I said, all right, black men life coaches. When you popped up, I said, hey, okay, let me see what he's talking about. I'm like, all right, I like, I, I like this guy. I like, I, like, I like what I see. And when I started to listen to some of the stuff that you were talking about, one of the things that made me laugh was you, had, you were doing a, um, another podcast episode. And you said, man, listen, I did not want to be a coach. I do not want to be a coach. That was not, I didn't really mean that. That was not in the thing. Sure, we make money, but I did not want to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, so just talk to me a little bit about life coaching, man, because mm-hmm. it seems to be romanticized today in the social media era that we, that mm-hmm. we live in today. Everybody's a life coach, just like mm-hmm. everybody has a podcast. Mm-hmm. Um, but just talk to me about the experience of becoming a life coach, what is it to you, um, mm-hmm. the significance of it? Just, just talk to me a little bit about that. So I'm really blessed, yeah, and like, much to your point, I, I had no intention of being a coach. So yeah. having lost everything twice, getting past the suicide, rebuilding after the diagnosis, I went and built up another seven-figure business. I closed that down to come and do what I do now because I had a very powerful meditation experience that showed me that this was the path for me to take. But the path that I was given wasn't about being a coach. It was about sharing my story, sharing my, you know, my, um, my experiences through my book. There's one there, um, uh, the podcasts. And I wanted to speak. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to speak. I wanted to, to write. But nobody was going to give me a platform to speak. So I started the podcast. And then I started doing my own events because nobody's going to give some kid off the block. So I, I got to put my money where my mouth is. So I was spending right. my money running around the world putting on events, begging people to come for free to listen to me, getting pictures, getting audio, getting video and building it out until people were like, oh, this is good. Come and speak here, come and speak there. And that built up. But what started happening is more and more people started saying, 
after like a workshop or whatever, you know, I really want to work with you. Like, ah, I don't really want to. <laughs> I'm, not, yeah. I'm not trying to do that. Mm-hmm. But it, 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 it got louder and louder and louder. And then um, I specifically had the vision for our Micro to Millions program, which is our signature program. Um, and then I found the parts of the coaching experience I particularly love. So now, you know, our business does well, it does a couple million a year. Um, we're projecting to do, you know, more than that this year. We've got some things cooking for that. And so I've got a team of coaches that do most of the delivery on the coaching. And I found where my sweet spot is. I love doing the VIP days, right? I love doing the workshops. I love um, my mastermind. I do some of the calls for the mastermind, the main group coaching my coaches do. But I found where my groove really is, where I can come in and have that rapid transformation. I think one of the things that I don't like about coaching, and this is not throwing shade on anyone, is this idea of being the perpetual teat that people are going to come and suck on for a long period of time it's like i'm I'm not trying to have so with us with our programs on terms of one-on-one coaching there's a time limit of six months you cannot be one-on-one coach with us for more than six months that keeps us honest that we have to get to the goal and lets you know that you're going to have to go out and then fly by yourself you can't just forever be coming to not that we just leave you out in the cold but i'm saying in terms of intense one-on-one work we don't more than i know people have had the same client for two years two years where's the change man it doesn't really and i think you know, it's a sad fact that the commercial, the low barrier to entry has made the commercialization of coaching. Hmm. It's bastardized, man. Yeah. It's a paycheck for people. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are marketing stuff to coaches. You know, come and give me 20 grand. I'm going to make you, right? Yeah. Come and buy my latest marketing thing. Right. Right. There's a lot of money in that. Selling Mm -hmm. snake oil to people, which is sad, I think. There are real powerful modalities out there. I've seen it. I work with coaches myself. I've always got a coach of some way, shape, or form. I spend a couple hundred a year on my own personal development. I spent more last year, including a hundred grand I spent on a mastermind for myself. So I continue to be coached. I continue to invest in coaching. We continue to deliver coaching. But there's a level of integrity that I think is wanting in many pockets of this industry. And it's gonna take more people coming to it, I think, not because it's a paycheck, but because it's a calling to bring that integrity to it. So is your, is your coaching, is it, is it business-based? Is it wellness-based? Is it just overall life-based? What is the foundation so of it, I guess? We, we call ourselves transformational coaching because one okay. of the things that I, I, I preach is there's no, there's no, there's no separation between these areas of my life. Right. How you show up in business is going to leave clues as to how you're showing up in life. How you show up in life is going to leave clues to how you show up in business or career or relationships or your money. They're all linked in and they're clues that tie them all in together. So we focus on empowering people to be conscious creators, the reality that they live in and to be empowered, to be independently powerful enough to direct that and put it into other areas of their life too yeah yeah no that, that, that's good man that's powerful um mm-hmm. how does how does a man lose millions of dollars more than once yeah and still and, and still find his way of being able to 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 fight through and move through and to, to build it all again how does that happen i mean the first time i was young right i was i was young i, I think i was like 19 maybe just turned 20 when i lost everything so I just dusted my shoulders off. It's like, I'm going to do it. How, how, did, how did you lose it? Is it just frivolous spending? Is it no, just it was bad a frivolous investment? spending. I didn't have the right paperwork, so the government came, came and took everything. <laughs> okay. I didn't have the right yeah. licensing for how we operate. The business itself was fine, but how we funded our business was technically illegal because it, it didn't yeah. have the right licensing. So government just says, thank you. <laughs> I'll take that. So that, that one, the second time I trusted the wrong people and it got stolen. Everything got stolen. The first time I was fine, the second time I wasn't. That's when the suicide actually, suicidal ideation actually came after the second time. Because you've got wow. to remember, I thought I was the bee's knees, right? Mm. I was reading, thinking, grow rich at 17 years old, right? I had the arrogance of youth. I had the ego of untested youth. And so when my identity, which was tied up in those early successes, was ripped away and I was left, with evidence quite to the contrary that I knew everything, my whole sense of self was gone. And, and Wounded ego and everything. 
destroyed, destroyed, <laughs> yeah, destroyed. I yeah. had nothing left to give. I had nothing left to give. And so the yeah. journey back from that um, included a lot of healing, rebuilding the self, uh, learning that I'm more than what the numbers are in the bank account, learning that life is more than that, that allowed me to go and then build another successful business. And now having closed out that one, I'm now on another successful business now that it's closer to my purpose and mission. And again, in doing, in doing my research from you, man, I listened to you in a couple of different outlets. Um, and I, I gathered a couple quotes that, that you said, and mm -hmm. I want to read some of them off to you. And I want you to just kind of elaborate to me what they mean. Mm -hmm. um, the first one that you said was, true abundance is letting go of something, knowing that the goodness is going to come from somewhere else. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, Can you elaborate mm -hmm. on that, please? Yeah, I've got a, another catchphrase, a Danism. God never shortchanges. God never shortchanges. The universe never shortchanges. We're never left wanting. So when I can give without thinking about where something's going to come back from, I'm actually embodying a true belief in my abundance. Not, ah, oh, I'm going to invest this here. I'm going to invest some time with this person. I'm going to do this good deed because I know it's going to come back. I'm going to do this good deed because I'm just going to do this good deed, knowing that God doesn't shortchange and it has to come back. This person might not hit me back up, right? This person might not call my name out in a good way, but God will never shortchange me. It will always come from somewhere. Yep, yep, yep. Mm. That's, that's, that's good, man. I want to read another one. Um, you said that su success isn't a cause, it's an effect. Success isn't a cause, it's an effect. It's an effect that follows the life that is overflowing in full. <laughs> can, can you expound on that, man? That's a, that, was, that was a good one. I had to rewind that one a few times to make sure I heard that one. <laughs> say, 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 break that down for me, please. So, so we've got the law of cause and effect, right? It's an, a natural law. Um, everything that we're experiencing is the effect of a causation. The causation ultimately is always going to be our field, our unconscious thoughts, our unconscious behaviors, our emotional state. These are always going to be the things that proceed to whatever we are. Everything that we are to th that we're receiving now, everything that we're experiencing, like I said, we work with people on their finances, right? Your financial situation right now is a direct correlation of the habits and behaviors, which is based on your unconscious thoughts, which is based on your unconscious emotional state and the level of healing or the level of trauma that you're operating from. It's a cycle. So success is something that's going to naturally follow on from having an emotional state, unconscious programming, and habits and behaviors that speak to success. So instead of trying to do successful things, focus on what does success feel for me? When I see myself in my mind's eye as being successful, what are the emotions that I live in, that I sit in? Okay. Mm -hmm. What stories am I holding that support that? And which ones am I holding that negate it? Okay, what healing can I do around that? The unconscious habits and behaviors are going to follow on from that. Then I think about my conscious time. What am I doing? What's my environment? Is it supporting me having the emotional state, which is going to lead to the thoughts, which is going to lead to the behaviors, right? So that intentionality that leads into the emotion, that leads into the thoughts, that leads into the behaviors will always lead to the outcome. It's a mathematical uh, certainty. Mm, mm. Yeah, that's, that's good, man. What is the... Uh, what is the beyond intention paradigm? What, what is that? So when I woke up one morning, I think it was 2000 and 2015, I think it was. So I wake up 2015. I'm in a lovely home. Um, I've got a couple of nice watches on the, on the shelf. You know, I made a few trips. I was like, damn, I was supposed to be working out how to kill myself. Mm. And here I am in a life that feels pretty good. I was working out, you know, I, I, I had great friendships. I, I had healed relationships with my family, healed relationships with myself. I was in a really good place. My business was doing well. And I realized that I'd inadvertently healed. I had inadvertently come to a place where everything that had gone wrong had actually revealed itself to be the path to things working out. And so I'd been trying for a little while to map out the journey that I'd been going on. I'd done a few drafts of the book, Stepping Beyond Intention, that's over my shoulder, but it hadn't really worked out to be what I wanted it to be. But when I sat and had that thought, it really clicked. Ah, 
I get it now. And so I went back and I started reworking the steps for what Beyond Intention is, is today and really ironing it out and really sitting with it and going through my, my memories and going through the stories of what I've been through to really line up. And then we ended up after a while getting the four steps that we have now, which are accept, clear, gratitude, and listen. And so you know, a big part of the journey for my calling to come and do what I do now was realizing that the journey that I'd been on, everything, all the stuff, had really been the gift that gave me this to share with the world. It had been a mm. gift for me to be able to share this with the world. And so now, you know, years later, Lord knows how many people have been through some program or workshop or coaching with us that's applied this. We, we now know without a shadow of a doubt that this is real and it works to support people creating conscious, consciously creating a life that they really, really love. What was the, um, what was the, is, is there a moment that you can pinpoint in your life where things just kind of, they, they flip for you, you know, healing wise? Was it, was it a matter of just, again, removing yourself from, from an environment? Was it connecting yourself in a specific relationship? Is there, is there a moment or a few moments that you can kind of pinpoint where, you know what, reflecting back on these things or this thing, that's where stuff started to, you know, look a little bit different for me or feel different. Yeah. I would say, number one, looking back at the whole suicide story back in 2015 and seeing the gift of it. And then certainly the meditation that I had the 13th of February, 2018, when I stepped in to do what I do now, that meditation that I was on, when I understood because I was grateful for parts of the experience, right? I was grateful that I was close with my family. I was grateful for this. I was grateful for that. But there was stuff that I swept under the carpet. In that moment, I was grateful for all of it because mm. all of it had led me to that moment where I could have that beautiful experience. There was no part of it that I wanted to do over or I wanted to, you know, not have anymore. The healing wasn't in wanting something to change. It was accepting it for what it was and seeing the beauty in it. Man, that's, that's, so, that's so good, man. I, I remember... When I first started going to therapy years ago, um, I remember my therapist pulled out a pamphlet and there was something on there called Radical Acceptance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I, remember, I remember reading that and digesting it. And she said, listen, you have to read this and you know, really understand it. And I remember I would, I would really bump my head against it like, I gotta accept everything. What if, mm -hmm. it, what if it hurt my feelings? What if I don't like it? What if I don't like this mm -hmm. person? Da -da 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 -da. Mm -hmm when I truly understood the power of accepting everything and I did not need to control things to make myself um, uh, lose that fear, mm -hmm. everything changed, man. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was, I mean, I, I would find myself dis having family disagreements or disagreements with arguments. I say, you know what? You got it. Mm -hmm. but, not, but not in a passive aggressive, smart ass way, but genuinely, you know what? I don't need to force it in, in, in this moment. And, mm -hmm. and the power of acceptance, man, it, it sounds so cliche, mm -hmm. it works. And I think some people get upset because they think it means that you have to be, you know, people get to walk all over you. Accepting yeah. someone doesn't mean that someone gets to disrespect you. Right. It means that you just honor the fact that they're a disrespectful person. Yep. And you're no longer caught up in the emotional roller coaster of their disrespect. You just yep. hold them for where they are. You can hold them at 100 feet. Yep. You're no longer emotionally invested in trying to have them be something that they're not. And you're right. okay with them being that, but you're not choosing necessarily to be a part of that experience emotionally anymore. And it's, and it's accepting the fact that, listen, as a human being, mm -hmm. you are allowed to experience these different emotions that happen in the experiences mm -hmm. of life. You know, we're, mm -hmm. we're not, <laughs> none of us, you know, are too good to experience any level of emotion. Mm -hmm. right that's that's not how this life thing works mm -hmm. you know it's it's okay to experience a different variety range of emotions so that, mm -hmm. that's that's so good man and that, that's so powerful listen i've i, I, re I really got to get your thoughts on the, the stop meditation and you know why people shouldn't meditate because people I, would wait, wait 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 i don't think people should not meditate well that's 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 what i was getting to was because yeah. when you really digest your messaging it's, it's actually completely the opposite. <laughs> it's, 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 it's just that people shouldn't meditate um, or people, when they meditate, they should not uh, supplement meditation for not taking action. 
right? Exactly. Is, is, that, exactly. is that correct? So can you kind yes. of just break that down a little bit? Yeah. So let's say, for example, that you want to be financially secure, mm -hmm. right? And the sum total of the moves that you make to ensure the outcome is to meditate every morning about financial security, right? What's going to happen? Maybe you're going to get some opportunities. Maybe some things are going to come your way. But if all you're doing is meditating or doing your prosperity chart, <laughs> nothing's going to change. Right, right, right. There is always going to be a need to move through time and space with physical action. Even if you're meditating to win the lottery, you still need to, even if you do it on your phone, you still have to move your fingers to buy a lottery ticket. You still need to, or even if you're ordering a phone online, you still have to take some action in three-dimensional reality to facilitate. Yeah. You're meditating for financial abundance. That money's going to go into your bank account. You're going to move through time and space with the money or for the money. And yet we, we sit in this thing that oh, I've got my vision board for the love of my life but you're not working on yourself. Oh, you know, I made my mind movie about having my body healthy, but you're still eating junk. You're still doing stuff that makes you feel crap. You're not working out. You're not getting fresh air. You're not drinking water. Right. Right. I always love the story um, of the man who was in a, a village or a town and there was a flood. And at first they came with a car and they're like, hey, like, you know, we need to, we need to take you. The, the flood's coming. The, your house is going to get flooded. Don't worry, I've prayed, God's got me. Then, you know, they come and, you know, they've got like a, they've got like a boat and he's like, oh, don't worry. I'm like, God's got me, right? <laughs> um, turns out, you know, the water goes really high. He's in this valley, the water goes, the, he's sitting on the roof. They come and bring a helicopter with like a, a rope ladder. Like, come on, man, we've got his, don't worry. God's got me. So he, he dies, obviously. Gets to heaven. <laughs> he's like, yo. It will happen. Yeah. What happened? I said the car. I said the boat. Right. I said the right. helicopter. Right, right, right. And that essentially speaks to what the stop meditating message is all about. Meditation is a beautiful, powerful tool. But if left as its own device in and of itself with nothing else, we're missing a big chunk of the game. Right. And, and not properly deploying a part of the game that can change the game for us. Yeah, that's that's good, man. Tell me, tell me something that 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 Dan, you know, may, may struggle with. You know, something that something that's still maybe a thorn on your side. Something that you really want to try to be intentional about working on. It's something that you still haven't quite grasped. It's something maybe it's even something that you know your your wife may say, "Babe, you're doing that again." You know, you know she she's she's on your body. What's what's something that you may you know may have to be a little weakness of yours? It's um. Allowing my Asperger's to be an excuse for my shortcomings sometimes dealing with people. See, you even said it's an excuse, man. It's not an excuse. It's not an excuse. I'm talking about, I'm talking about in a good way. I mean, like, like it's, that's, I, I got what you meant right there in that moment. You said that allowing it to be an excuse. It's not mm -hmm. an excuse. It, it's, a, it's, just who, it's, part of, it's part of who you are. However, what I have had a propensity to do from time to time is to, because I have, I've like, for example, my assistant, Amy, like I don't have to be airs and graces. She gets it right. Uh, my team, not all of the team get to, to deal with me directly. Only certain get to deal with me directly so that I don't have to be on it all the time. I can just, and they, they just, right. My family, like, ah, he's just being autistic again. Then let me get on with it. Mm, right? mm. Not everybody that comes into my space has got the bandwidth to give me that breathing space. And sometimes I get lazy. Mm. With that. Mm. Does that make sense? Enfor en 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 enforcing the boundaries? Is that, is that, um, is that essentially what it is? Not so much enforcing the boundaries in terms of, like, I can be short. Um, all social interactions for me, just to give you some context, social interactions for me, a completely conscious process. Mm. I need to make sure that I'm listening to what you're saying, that I'm giving pause for break because my be natural behavioral pattern is going to be, I've got something I need to say, I need to get it out. <laughs> right? Right, right. Very objective. Oh, this is the objective. Da, 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 da. Right? And, and there can be a, a loss of the emotional, relational context of the relating with people. Got it. Right? Yeah. Like I said, the people that generally are in my direct sphere, 
all right, yeah, he's been autistic again, like, right? But not everybody has that bandwidth to know, oh, that's what's going on. And so I can go to, oh, no, you know, it's because I'm, 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 I've got Asperger's versus, oh, no, it's, this is just how I showed up in that moment. So it's, so it's giving yourself grace and being gentle with yourself. Boom. That's good. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, that, 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 that is a tough one, especially us as, as men, right? You know, mm-hmm. and, and bringing it back full circle to the, you know, the, the first question about um, the pressures of being a father and a, and a husband. Um, mm-hmm. those, those are the things that I see a lot of guys having a hard time with, man. You know, giving, giving ourselves some grace, man. You know, being gentle with ourselves. It is mm-hmm. hard. You know, right? You know, so that's a, that, that that's good, man. Listen, Dan, this is this has been a terrific conversation, man. Um, Agreed. I can't I can't thank you enough for coming on here, man, and spending your precious time. Um, listen, you in Cabo right now? I'm in Northeast Ohio, so I'm sure looking out your window looks much better than, than uh, what I'm, I got. I'm going not on I'm here. not gonna make you jealous. I'm not gonna make you jealous. Yeah, yeah, I might chill, just be man. looking just, at the ocean. Just, yeah, <laughs> just just relax. Just, just relax. This, this, this six inches of snow I'm looking at, bro. It don't oh, it don't compete, wow. man. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, 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 terrible, yeah. man. Well, listen, man, I, I genuinely thank you for coming on, man. This has been a beautiful conversation. Um, I, I cannot thank you enough for, en- enough for this, man. So thank you so My much. My um, I, I, I genuinely appreciate it. Before I get you out of here, man, I just want to hit you with a few rapid questions, if possible. Um, sure. get, get you out of here, man. Enjoy, enjoy your time with your family. Uh, first, first and foremost, what is the vision, you know, for, for Dan, you know, for maybe business, personally, professionally, spiritually? Mm-hmm. What is What's the overall vision that you see for yourself? Legacy right now. Legacy. Mm-hmm. What's mm-hmm. the mark that's being left? And how yeah. is that going to have a positive impact on the world? That's, that's for me right now. What are your intentions for 2022? And I know you have a thing of with, with intentions, but what, what do you want to be intentional about this year? This year, I've got um, my documentary that we're finishing writing now. I'm going to start filming here soon. Um, I'm working on my doctorate proposal, getting that in uh, and getting my PhD um, and just taking, taking the message to new heights, taking the message to new mm. heights. That's what 2022 is all about. What is your purpose and how is that connected to what you're doing today? My purpose is to empower people to recognize that abundance is their natural state. It's not something that's abnormal. It's not something that we need to hunt or to kill for. It's something that's already here waiting for us to recognize its existence. And my purpose is awakening people to that. That's good, man. That's, that's good. What, what is something about you that people would be surprised to know? Oh. I only learned to swim a couple of years ago. I couldn't swim. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, living I living on the now. ocean and you just not learning to swim. <laughs> I, I learned to swim a couple of years ago. Um, yeah, that was, a, that was a big one. Yeah, learned to swim a couple of years ago. What scares you? Ooh. I'd say it's definitely not being a great dad, not being yeah. a great husband, not being a great leader, being out of integrity with the values that I hold dear. Mm-hmm. What is your favorite quote? Oh, what's a favorite quote of mine right now? Um, I've, I've got one for you. And this was actually another pivotal moment that came in. I'll tell you really super quick the story. I was coming to the tail end of the, the deeper part of my healing journey, um, dealing with my failures again. And uh, in retrospect, that is. And one of my friends was like, I don't know why you think people care so much about, <laughs> about you. They've probably got their own stuff going on. And uh, I remember there's a meme. Um, it's got a guy looking up at the heavens and says, Lord, save me from my haters. And God's looking down and saying, man, nobody's thinking about you. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That yeah, yeah that, that's good, man. Um, mm-hmm. What's the best advice you've ever received? Just that one. People don't care about you as much as they think they, they do. So stop allowing your emotional state to be dictated about your ideas about what other people may or may not be thinking about you. Good. Man, if you could pick up that phone and call your 20-year-old self, knowing what you know today, what would you tell mm-hmm. yourself? Oh, I wouldn't want to spoil the ride for him because it's going to lead him to where he is now. But <laughs> yeah. certainly um, seek counsel, not opinions. Beautiful, man. Well, listen, man, that's, that's where we're going to leave it, man. Leave it at right there. This is, this is 
again, this has been a beautiful conversation. I genuinely appreciate it, man. Tell people where they can find you, what you have coming up, um, access to your books, maybe some of your programs and things like that you have coming up. Give people some information, please. Easiest way to do anything is to head to dreamwithdan.com. Um, if there are any workshops and such going on, they'll be on the events tab. Uh, my books are on the books tab. My podcasts are on the podcast tab. My blogs are on the blog, blog tab. Uh, we've got a whole free resources page, um, including a video that I've got on how to be a harmonious money magnet. Uh, we've got some visualizations on there around abundance. Lots of goodies. Dreamwithdan.com. That's where it's all at. Damn, man. Thank you again, man. I genuinely appreciate that again, man. Thank you so much to the community at LYP. We appreciate you. We love you. Remember, be intentional. Be intentional, intentional, intentional about your healing. That is your responsibility. Much love to everybody. Another episode. Peace.